I don't have a great deal to add to the handout that you have coming in the door. Uh, however, my experience is that most people haven't read the handout, and so uh, I will tell you what's in it. Uh, as you heard, Professor von Frossen is the uh, uh, Makash Professor of Philosophy Emeritus at Princeton and presently a distinguished professor of philosophy at San Francisco State. He's the chief architect of modern empiricism in the late 20th and 21st centuries. Born in Goetz, and I never get Dutch pronunciations correct, so don't count on that one. In the Netherlands, von Frossen eventually immigrated with his, with his family to Canada, received his BA from the University of Alberta, followed by his MA and PhD degrees from the University of Pittsburgh. With his passion residing in philosophy of science and philosophical logic, he served as president of the Philosophy of Science Association, editor of the Journal of Philosophy, Philosophical Logic, co-editor of the Journal of Symbolic Logic. His scholar, scholarly contributions consist of several books and, art, and countless articles, including uh, books, books including Current Issues in Quantum Logic, Existence and Explanation, and What Was Perrin's Real Achievement. In recognition of his record of scholarly achievement, service in the philosophy of science, great intellectual energy and mentoring of graduate students, he was recently awarded the 2012 inaugural Hempel Award. What I'd like to add to that is that I was pleased to discover that we shared some uh, teachers uh, in graduate school. Uh, both, of, uh, the, the, both of us have a great deal of respect for those, uh, those people. Uh, and knowing that gave me even more respect for him because it showed me the great breadth of his understanding and knowledge. And uh, uh, he's a great soul, a great person, as well as a great philosopher. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, I, I, ne I never think I'm going to live up to my introductions, but we'll try. Okay. So um, I want to talk about naturalism in epistemology. Uh, naturalism, of course, has a big metaphysical side, uh, and I really don't want to touch on that uh, because I don't do metaphysics. Um, of course, you can still criticize metaphysics if you don't do it, but I won't do that. I don't want to do that just now. Uh, I try to be an empiricist. I want to be an empiricist. Um, you know, I sometimes people say, "Oh, you are an empiricist," and then I have to say, "Well, you know, I'm an empiricist in the way that you know Saint Paul said you can be a Christian. I mean, in the sense of trying to be one." Um, Empiricism is a long tradition in, philo in philosophy, um, but uh, it changes. It changes uh, a great deal, and um, during the 20th century, it, you know, it had some misfortunes. Uh, I hope that we've learned from the mistakes and that we can try and uh, develop an empiricist point of view that is viable today. Uh, now, but my focus will be on a contrast with naturalism in epistemology. And um, I will try to, first of all, say what I think is the common ground. And there's quite a bit of common ground between these two traditions um, in philosophy. Then talk about the parting of the ways, exactly how uh, we're going to disagree. So that's the, uh, the outline. Um, uh, ah, yeah. Um, when I say that I want to be an empiricist, and I want to think about what empiricism can be today, uh, the, the first thing that I want to say is that empiricism is not a theory. It's not a thesis. It is a philosophical position, but in the sense of a stance. Okay? And by a stance, I mean a stance, a position that's a stance, uh, is a combination of attitudes, approach, uh, commitments, um, it may involve uh, or include or presuppose some beliefs as well. They usually come along with uh, commitments you make, but it's a way of going about philosophy. Now, naturalism has actually been presented throughout in exactly the same way. And I want to, um, to show that from some of the text. Um, in, in the 1940s, Columbia University in New York City was the center of naturalism. It was the, 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 uh, the new philosophical movement in, in America at that point. Uh, and there was a manifesto, uh, a book that was called Naturalism and the Human Spirit. And the people writing in, them, in it, well, some of them we don't really remember anymore. Some of them you never hear about in, philo in philosophy courses. But some of, some of the names we do remember. 
uh, Dewey, Hook, Nagel, and Randall, I would say uh, you will still uh, see coming up in philosophy courses and in philo philosophical literature. Um, now, each of these emphasize that when they say naturalism, they are not speaking of a theory about what the world is like. They are not talking about a thesis or a doctrine or a dogma, but rather about an approach, a way of going about philosophy, right? So Sidney Hook says, it's a commitment to a procedure, not a theory of metaphysics. And the picture of is of the young John Herman Randall, uh, an attitude and a temper, right? Essentially a philosophic method and a program. Now, that's quite different from many positions in philosophy. I mean, when, if I ask you for some examples of positions in philosophy, you're very likely to mention theses. For example, um, that um, you know, Platonism, that uh, abstract entities are real, or the contrary, uh, nominalism, there are no universals. Um, or in philosophy of science, the position that there are laws of nature, or the contrary, there are no laws of nature and so forth. These are all theses, right? They are statements about what is the case. And naturalism is presented as not that sort of philosophical position, but rather a philosophical approach or methodology. Um, Penelope Maddy at the University of California in Irvine is a main writer about naturalism today. Uh, and for the last 15 years, she has been also trying to explain what exactly it is to be a naturalist in philosophy. And she says exactly the same thing as they said 60 years ago. Naturalism is not a doctrine, but an approach. It's not a set of answers, but a way of addressing questions. It is not a set of beliefs. It's not a set of propositions to be affirmed. It has no theory. Now, you see, these are just the sort of things that I want to say when I'm trying to explain what I think empiricism really is. Empiricism in philosophy, uh, although it has in the past being presented, especially in slogan form, by means of statements like experience is our one and only source of information about the world, for example, right? It's a statement of fact, if it is a fact. Well, that's not how to think about empiricism or naturalism in the philosophy, in philosophy. These are approaches, ways of doing philosophy, okay? So at least that's how it is present, presented here. Uh, and when I look for common attitudes, common items in the two stances, I see three especially. One is that both naturalism and empiricism are quite anti-metaphysical. Right? That part of the naturalist work and a part of the empiricist work in philosophy is critique of metaphysics. But it's not, a, not the same critique and it's not the critique of the same metaphysics. Okay? So there's something common, something not common. Uh, the centrality of the sciences, yeah, both give a central place to science and both will describe science as having a central place. I personally would put it this way. I would say that the sciences, that is a paradigm of rational inquiry into what the world is like, right? Now, mind you, I say a uh, paradigm, okay? I think the naturalist is more likely to say something more, more, I mean more specific and we'll come to that, right? The third, and this is what I will talk about for a little while here, is anti-foundationalism. Uh, so that in epistemology, empiricism especially was associated with foundationalist epistemology, the idea that there's a rock solid foundation for knowledge and for, for building up rational belief and rational opinion about what the world is like. And it is true that uh, in the 18th, 18th century empiricism would say that this rock, this rock-like foundation is uh, the basic given in the senses, right? Um, but in the 20th century, uh, it's become part and parcel of, of uh, empiricism and of naturalism that there is no such foundation for knowledge or rational belief, that we have Life without foundations is what we have to learn uh, to have. Uh, so I'll, let me talk about this for a moment, just to emphasize you know, quite strongly how I, how I see it and how I think that they also see it. So um, Otto Neurath, a German 
empiricist philosopher um, before the Second World War. You know, put it that way, he says, when it comes to the sciences, and this is his paradigm of knowledge and um, uh, rational belief, is that um, we are like mariners at sea, trying to repair and rebuild their boat while at sea. We don't have a dry dock. So, <coughs> um, and uh, this was quoted again and again by Klein, Willard van Norman Klein, um, who uh, is now quite often mentioned as you know the, 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 the father or the main instigator of naturalism in epistemology in the middle of the 20th century, right? Norad, like, so yes, um, like in science to a boat, which you must rebuild while staying afloat in it. Um, but there are two sides to this anti-foundationalism that uh, Klein makes very clear. Oh, sorry, I seem to be going backwards. Ah. Um, the two quotes, the first one I just gave you about Neurath and how he agrees that we are like mariners at sea. Um, the second, the human condition is the human condition. Now, by that, what he means is that he accepts as right Hume's critique of induction. Okay. Um, the two quotes concern two planks of foundationalism. First of all, there's a rejection of any secure basis an absolutely secure basis on which we build. And secondly, the second part, it rejects the idea of a secure construction of justified belief, no matter what basis you choose. Right? And of course, that was the, the dream of induction. Um, now this was a, a big problem for empiricism during the 20th century. Okay? And I think that nat the naturalists, to some extent, um, what should I say, they, they, they run parasitically on some of the empiricist work. Um, and I'll, I'll just have to explain this rather quickly because you know, I want to get on to my critique of, natu of naturalism. But um, let me distinguish between induction with a little letter I, which is something that we all do, which is we go beyond our evidence in what we believe. Um, St. Augustine gives the example of uh, uh, the ocean. He says, yes, I believe that the ocean is real, but he, has never, he had never seen the ocean. During his life, he never got to see the ocean. He, he crossed the Mediterranean several times, but he had never seen the ocean. But I believe it is there. I believe it's real. It goes beyond my evidence. So in that sense, you know, <laughs> we are engaged in induction with a little letter I all the time, right? But so are people who are superstitious, right? They go beyond their evidence. And so are people who are rational. They go beyond their evidence, right? But induction with a capital I is what the philosophers would was, were always arguing about. <coughs> it's the idea that there is actually a recipe that a rational person has to follow when going beyond the evidence. And this recipe, is, when I say a recipe, I mean it's something that is learnable, right? Um, Ampliative means going beyond the evidence. Objective does not involve input from your feelings, um, anything subjective. Rationally compelling, meaning that you would be irrational if you didn't take, accept the conclusions of the induction. And finally, reliable, a reliable way to get to the truth um, that you are investigating. Right? And now the question is whether there could possibly be such a thing. And um, uh, when Hume addressed it, you know, he was in, a, in a, uh, a context where the great intellectual hero was Newton in the Britain of his time. And Newton, of course, said that he did everything by induction. So apparently he believed that there was such a method. And when Hume begins to criticize it, he's running against the grain on that. Now, in the 20th century, Reichenbach, and Reichenbach, I, I should immediately say, is one of my heroes, one of my philosophical heroes, right? Uh, logical empiric empiricist working in Berlin uh, before the Second World War, then uh, in America afterward. Um, he was developing the empiricism for his time. And um, 
he, when, when he was president of the um, American Philosophical Association, Pacific Division, uh, after he started teaching at, UC at UCLA. <coughs> and he, his presidential address was a critique of both rationalists and traditional empiricists. He was going to be an empiricist, but he was going to reject the empiricist, the empiricist program of the 18th century. And um, he said, here's the extent to which I accept Hume's critique. There are certainly conditions under which no rule whatsoever would get you to the truth. Um, there are, it's possible for the world to be such that it will just systematically frustrate any method you could use to get at what the, what the, what the world is like. That's conceivable, right? But, he says, this is what we can save from the idea of induction, that there really is a rule that would work under any conditions when any, when the, when, when any rule would work, okay? And when asked what it was, you know, he developed a whole theory about this, he says, well, basically it's this, that you base your probabilities for the future on the statistics that have been gathered so far. And that sounds, yeah, that sounds very commonsensical, right? Um, if the statistics on the connection between smoking and lung cancer uh, have shown a strong correlation, then it seems rational that then you say, okay, my probability for, um, uh, for a correlation between smoking and lung cancer in the future is based on, that statistic, on those statistics, right? Sounds right. Now, the point though is that a rule like that, if you state it too simply, um, is going to be, um, well, trivially bad. I mean, imagine this. Suppose that I was appointed to be, um, have, I got a new job, weather forecaster in Salt Lake City, okay? And every day I have to give the probability of, of snow that day. Imagine, right? And so what I do is uh, I look back at the statistics for the last 50 years, and I see that the proportion of days when it snowed <coughs> in Salt Lake City was, was what? One in 20? Five percent? Let's say five percent, okay. So I said, well, you know, I really want to be right in my predictions. I want my probabilities to really be uh, calibrated, to be that it means being in accord with what will actually happen. So every day I will say five percent, every day. So in the long run, I'm certainly gonna be right. Now, of course, you wouldn't be very happy with a weather forecaster like that, right? I mean, on, on July 3rd, he says, probability of snow is 5%. And on January 3, he says it's 5%. No, I mean, you know, that doesn't seem right, right? And even if he gather, keeps gathering statistics, well, you know, every thousand days, he can get it up by, by, by 10%, but, you know, it's, it's not very good, right? So what is wrong with his procedure here is that we want to say that whatever rule you're following, we have to be able to ask specific questions about specific circumstances. So what it, not just what is the probability overall of snow in Salt Lake City, but what's the probability of snow in July? What's the probability of snow on a day in January, right? So questions like that you can call challenges, right? And the rule had better meet the challenges, right, for specific subjects. So um, this, this question of whether there could be a rule that could meet all the challenges was taken up by statisticians and philosophers. And um, they didn't, you know, you, it would not be admissible to have a challenge that you could only meet with a crystal ball, right? They have to be challenges of the sort that, you know, are reasonable for this kind of enterprise. So this, this, so this was made precise. And uh, the exact criterion, the, the statisticians called, the rule is computably well calibrated. Now, what did they find? Well, actually, the first person to give uh, a proof that Reichenbach was just wrong was his student, Hilary Putnam. Um, that there cannot be a rule whose output will be computably calibrated on, all, on, all, on you know, it cannot be a rule that will work whenever any rule whatsoever will work, which is what Reichenbach had announced. Okay. Because although it could work if, if you just, if you don't look at the challenges, or if you look at only a couple of challenges, it will not work for all the challenges. So it was actually an impossible ideal to have this kind of induction. So this is the, you know, I, I emphasize this because I want to say that in, in, on this point, Quine, the naturalist, 
and the empiricists have to agree because I think this is really very solid result. There is no such thing as this method of induction that for 200 years empiricists were trying to work on, okay? Uh, and it's part of the anti-foundationalism, part of, this, of the uh, uh, conclusion that we have to give up the hope of any kind of rock foundation for knowledge or for rational belief. But that doesn't mean that anything goes. Uh, that doesn't mean that there is no such thing as being rational, right? There are criteria of rationality. It's just not that. So, but anti-foundationalism reigns, okay? Your reaction, it is wrong to react to this that then we have all have to be skeptics. No, on the contrary, we have to say that if, we, if it is an impossible ideal to have a rock solid foundation, then we have the right to set the skeptical doubts aside and choose a foundation, choose, in other words, our beliefs. Um, we have to start from where we are and proceed rationally, right? But the, crit the critique cannot be that we are out of touch with the, with the rock solid foundation that we are not uh, respecting. We'll have to stick our necks out. There will be no alternative. In life without foundations, that's life where you have to stick your neck out, where you have no escape from the responsibility of being courageous. I think that's the situation. So far, so, so far uh, it's all agreement between naturalists and empiricists that I have been presenting in the, in the way that these traditions developed in the 20th century. But now I want to talk about the parting of the ways. And the whole question is, well, when I say we have to start from where we are, the question is, Oh, where are we starting from? What exactly is it that we take as our starting point? And um, when Quine is writing about this in the 60s and 70s, he's very clear, okay? Um, my starting point, he says, is the inherited world theory by which he means what the sciences tell us there is. From the point of view of our own science, which is the only point of view I can offer, I look only to natural science, however fallible, for an account of what there is. Okay. And when Maddy, uh, who quotes Quine, um, refers to that, he calls it the fundamental naturalistic impulse. <coughs> and the moment I see this, I feel a real tension. I mean, remember that when naturalism was being presented in this 1944 manifesto, but also in these writings by Maddy, it was presented as not a thesis, not a proposition to be held true, right? Not a belief, an approach, a way of approaching questions. But now it seems that the starting point is a belief. That we start with the belief that what the sciences tell us, you know, the accepted science tells us, is true. That's what the world is like. I, I'm not saying it is uh, irrational for a person to do that, but I also say that you know, it is very uh, surprising to see this suddenly be, be part, the basic part, of this philosophical position that had originally presented itself as a stance, as an approach, right? But let's see where it goes. So Penelope Maddy wrote a, a book um, called Second Philosophy. And the book describes you know, her ideal philosopher, <coughs> and she calls it the second philosopher. She wants to make contrast with what is called first philosophy, which is, I guess, metaphysics, right? But she says second philosopher. Um, when I read the book, I find that a lot of the time the, this ideal person that she describes doesn't sound to me like a philosopher, uh, but it does sound like the ideal of the naturalist. And this is a book in which she presents philosophical naturalism. So I'm not gonna, call it the second philosopher, okay? Uh, I'm gonna call it the naturalistic native. And when she describes this ideal person, this nat the naturalist ideal person, uh, she writes, uh, he's ac equally at home in astronomy, biology, botany, chemistry, linguistics, neuroscience, physics. I go, oh, Renaissance man, I mean, uh, right? <laughs> um, well, actually not so Renaissance, because then she adds that it stands towards subjects outside this, outside the sciences, is that his only interest in it is their psychology and sociology and anthropology. So this ideal 
this naturalistic ideal is someone who, if you ask about literature or art, well, he's interested in the psychological study of people who do literature, uh, the sociology of uh, the art world, um, the, psycho the, the, the psychopathology of religion, right? Um, in other words, is interested only in subjects from this point of view in this particular way. That is the ideal that she describes and that she calls the second philosopher. Now, I say that he doesn't sound so much like a philosopher to me. Certainly, a person could be like that, if anybody could be like that, uh, and never actually do any philosophy, right? So she describes now what is the reaction of this person to the traditional issues in philosophy. Uh, I have to tell you that, and I will show you by some quotes, it reminds me a lot of the heyday of logical positivism, when, in fact, they were overly arrogant about it. Um, Sir Alfred Ayer was the person who um, took logical positivism from Vienna and Prague to, to the English-speaking world with his little book, Language, Truth, and Logic. And uh, when he talked about things outside science, he had this attitude. If you make, for instance, a value statement, some other statement that seems to be not just within science, then he says, well, insofar as it's significant, it's an ordinary scientific statement. It may have a core that's a scientific statement, and insofar as it's not scientific, it's not significant. Right? And uh, sort of has an incomprehending stare about what people are about when they say anything else. Well, that seems to be what Maddie gives us when she starts describing how this, the ideal of the naturalist reacts to traditional philosophy. So about Kant, she says, deaf and blind to the Kantian transcendental project in the first place. About Carnap, well, that's not so long ago, Carnap, right? Uh, Carnap has these debates um, about uh, ontology and semantics, uh, confirmation and induction, um, realism and anti-realism. Um, he's a logical, logical positivist, a logical empiricist. And she says, well, this sort of debate just flies over its head. What are they squabbling about in the first place? Uh, about Reichenbach, my hero, he says, well, the naturalist is unimpressed, unimpressed by philosophical systems that place a second level of analysis above that of science. Now, this, I think, is the crucial thing. She is thinking of philosophers typically, think, thinking of themselves as being able to step back, look at science, take a critical attitude toward it, and discuss what it is. And that she calls, you know, a level of analysis above that of science, and she just thinks these are such a, this is a, you know, something that makes no sense to her. And about Hilary Putnam, well, Hilary Putnam, for instance, writes an article called Why Reason Cannot Be Naturalized, right? Uh, so she immediately puts in among the, when she says friends and foes of naturalism, Putnam goes into the foes, right? And uh, about Putnam's projects, that none of these projects hold any appeal for the naturalist and the naturalist has no motivation to undertake these inquiries. By this time, you may be begin beginning to think, well, what's left of philosophy? You know, what is still going to be there? Um, and you can see why I, you know, I'm reminded of Ayer saying, well, scientific questions make sense. Anything else is not cognitively significant. Right? And we don't have to do make any effort to understand it. So when I try to diagnose what this is, you know, this naturalist position, um, I think that what is at issue is the whole idea of interpretation. Um, what it sets aside and what other, what other philosophers do and engage in is questions that are interpretive. Questions, for instance, about an interpretation of what science is and what it does questions about you know, how to interpret and in what kind of interpretation or understanding to bring to the sciences that we have. Um, apparently, those questions simply do not arise for Maddie's naturalist. Right? And I think that the only good word to use for a position like that is fundamentalism. Now, when we say funda you know, fundamentalism is a, a term typically used, and people usually use it when they talk about people who have beliefs that they don't share. But of course, it's not their beliefs. I mean, 
it's not specific, it's to m what makes a person a fundamentalist is not that he has some specific beliefs. I mean, there are, there are Marxist-Leninist fundamentalists and Hindu fundamentalists and Christian fundamentalists. No, what they have in common is that interpretation is anathema. That raising any kind of interpretive question is met with, what are you about? This is totally transparent. Um, so, I mean, scriptures is maybe a bit of um, a, pro um, a provocative term, but, but um, uh, because a Marxist-Leninist wouldn't say that uh, thus capital is a scripture, right? But the point is that they have something that they present as not needing interpretation. In fact, that the very question of interpretation just simply doesn't arise. This is transparent. Um, what the naturalist says about the sciences is we are in it. This is a bit like a fish in water, right? What do you mean asking, asking what it means? Um, our relation to science, what questions can you raise about that? This is what we believe. This is what the world is like. Uh, the relation between the sciences and the world, well, it describes the world. That's it, right? Now, anathema to or resistance to interpretation, I think this is what we get as the crucial core of the naturalism that Maddie presents. Of course, you know, Penelope Maddie is a philosopher, right? And she actually does engage with other philosophers, but she tries to stick to her principles. And so the place where we see this actually playing out is when she is dealing with philosophy of science. And so I want to talk about that. Um, what are called the scientific realism debates. Um, they're about, the, the debate is about two views about science. Now, the nat from the Maddie's naturalist point of view, it doesn't make, I, neither side makes sense, really. Both sides are trying to do something that is simply not called for, namely to interpret, to, 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 ask, to answer questions about what science is, right? And so the empiricist view of science is that what science aims at is empirical success, that the bottom line for science is empirical success, meaning success in you know, um, the predictions, the, um, the, um, the actions that are based on the results of experiments, um, the experiments coming out in a way that the, that the theory that's proposed says they should. This is empirical success, right? And all the applications, uh, building bridges, um, flying airplanes, and so on, it's empirical success. The, um, the, the scientific realist has a different view, namely that the criterion of success is truth. Truth overall, not just truth about the empirical stuff, but truth also about whatever is behind the scenes, whatever is behind the phenomena, whatever is not observable. The criterion of success is truth. So these were the two positions that then were, you know, quite hotly debated in the 80s and 90s especially, right? That still goes on a little. Um, what's interesting here is to see how does this naturalist, how does Maddie react to this kind of philosophical discussion? And well, to stay true to her principles, what she has to say is, to the extent that there's a scientific question there, it makes sense. And to the extent that anything but a scientific question comes up, it makes no sense. So what she has to do is she has to s somehow say, well, really, I have to transpose this I have to see what is the nearest scientific question I can get at. And they're, they're disagreeing about things that have to do with what is ob unobservable. So the empiricist says um, it's only truth about what's observable that matters. And the scientific realist says it's truth about what's unobservable that really matters. Okay? So that must be what it is about. And what sort of things are unobservable? Well, things like atoms, right? So what she does is she changes the question from the interpretational question about what science is and what it does and what it aims at to the factual scientific question which scientists try to answer, are, sa are atoms real, right? And that's, of course, that's how she sees it. She sees it as a straightforward, simple, factual question. Uh, whereas an em empiricist would say, 
No, the question is whether the atomistic theory has a certain status, has certain virtues, and so on. But this is the nearest scientific question that she sees. And then she says, well, how can they be arguing about that? That's not a question for philosophers, right? But she takes it up in a number of places. And I want to ask, is it really the case that the naturalist is simply sticking with science and is not really unacknowledged, having an unacknowledged, underlying, presupposed philosophy of science of their own that is really carrying the day for them? Okay. And I mean, how could I try and bring that out to, how can I bring that to light? Well, if I want to argue that somebody is not just stating the facts but interpreting, what I have to do is to say, here's an alternative interpretation. Here's an alternative way of, of describing the facts, alternative to yours. So if mine is an interpretation, then yours is an interpretation too. They are rival interpretations. So that's what I have to do if I'm going to try and make a point against this. And the example that she comes back to again and again, and other philosophers certainly have described and discussed a great deal too, is one particular story that is often described as Jean Perrin, with his experiments in the early 1900s, proved that after all, molecules are real, okay? Atoms and molecules. And there's a story about this. I call it the scientific realist lore because this is how they always present it. They say, in the 19th century, several kinds of physics were growing up. One was the atomistic theory, or kinetic theory, as it's called, uh, uh, the theory that uh, bodies and gases are made up out of little particles, right, um, that are rushing around, that are hitting each other, and so on. This is the kinetic model, right? Uh, and the physics that refused to postulate atoms and thought instead we have to deal with continua, continuous media, or energy, or forces, but not with atoms, right? And there was a rivalry between them. Now, the first part of their story is that what was obstructing atomism was philosophical prejudices against the unobservable, okay? That it was philosophers who were somehow influencing the scientists to say, don't postulate these unobservable particles, okay? Because, because it's a prejudice against the unobservable. And the second part of their story is that by 1900, the science did all agree that the kinetic theory was empirically adequate, this model of everything being made out of, out of these particles, or these billiard ball particles, right? But they couldn't yet believe it to be true because all they could see was it had empirical success, but there were things about the molecules that they couldn't see, they couldn't determine yet, and so they couldn't say, yes, this is just true. And then what happened in 1905 and 1908 in a series of experiments by Perrin, it was shown clearly that the explanation for the empirical success was the reality of the molecules. So that's their story, okay? That is their story of what was going on. That's the story of what, it was, what was the real achievement of Perrin. Uh, let me say something about what these experiments were about. So in, um, quite early in the 19th century, this uh, biologist Brown, uh, wrote a report about um, the motion of dust particles in, a, in air or in a fluid. If, if you're in a room where the sun is coming in, you'll see dust particles bouncing around. But you'll probably explain it to yourself by, well, there's a draft or there's a convection current because part of the room is warm and part is not and so on. But, you know, uh, and in a, similarly in a, in a bottle of water, if there are some dust, some little particles in it, you'll see them moving around but you can have similar reasons like that it's a bit warmer at the bottom than at the top or whatever. So what he did was he did some experiments and he tried to isolate, you know, to have a, a closed container, little particles in the fluid, but isolated from all these external influences and the particles keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. You know, it is a random motion. Um, it looks like a drunkard's walk uh, when you, when you, um, uh, and here's the model that they gave. They said, well, the reason those dust particles are moving is that there are molecules, that the fluid is made up of molecules, and they are hitting the particle, and they make it move, okay? So even without dust particles, you have 
the, you know, the top, you have all these little molecules running around. That's your model of the gas or of the fluid. And then if there's a bigger particle in it, the one that you can see or see through the microscope, the reason it's moving is because it keeps getting hit by these molecules, right? So that's the model. That's the kinetic theory model. Okay, so this is the story. So now I think that we can ask a few embarrassing questions, first of all, about this story, about the way that the scientific realist tells it, right? Um, was Peran really out to establish the reality of molecules? You know, it doesn't seem so. It, you know, later on he wrote a book that uh, has a more philosophical story. But in 1910, he wrote up his report of the experiments. And he begins by saying that it was already completely accepted that everything is, you know, that uh, substances are composed of molecules and that the explanation of the Brownian motion is that the dust particles are being hit by the molecules. So as far as he was concerned, it was already established, right? So that's not what he was trying to do, it seems. At least he doesn't, at least by what he says, it's not what he was attempting to do. That's the first embarrassing question uh, for the account. The second one is, is it the case that the scientists at that point were saying, well, we're not sure it's true, but certainly it's empirically successful. Well, no, they knew it was not empirically successful, right? Uh, the, the model that he works with is these, these billiard ball models. They were already outdated by that time uh, because of the work on atomic theory. That was, and so Rutherford, he got his Nobel Prize uh, for uh, experiments that showed that these models that Perrin was working with were inadequate, while of course Perrin actually got the Nobel Prize for those very experiments. Okay? So there's a, a tension there about, you know, what, what is this story telling us? What is this history of science supposed to be? And the third question is, wha was the resistance to the, at to the atomic theory really a philosophical prejudice? Well, you see, the rivals, it's dynamism and negativism, they were also postulating unobservable entities. So it couldn't very well, and they were the ones who were the rivals, the ones who were, um, you know, uh, rejecting the, atom the, at the atomic theory. Um, well, they couldn't have very well have done it because they were saying that those atoms are unobservable when they themselves had unobservable entities in their theory. So there's a lot wrong with this staple story, right, that you will see, you will see in, in um, these writings. But now the question is, well, yeah, okay, fine. You've raised some questions about it, what, but what is the alternative? How else can we see what Perrin did? So if I'm going to contest their story, and if I'm going to argue that what they give is not simply a statement of what happened, but an interpretation, and they, they themselves are engaged in philosophical interpretation, what I should do is give the alternative and say, here's the alternative interpretation to show that what you're doing is also an interpretation. And so the way I, I see it, and this is, you know, the, of course, what I think is the empiricist way to see it, is that Perrin was doing something very important for the theory, right? Um, that he was addressing a basic requirement that every scientific theory has to meet, and it has to do with empirical success, right? Um, in order to explain exactly what it is, it's, it's more complicated than just making true predictions. Making true predictions is a bit of a caricature answer to what it is for a science to be empirically successful, okay? Something much more um, nuanced, uh, subtle is involved in this. And so in order to explain that, I'm going to give you an old example first, and then I'll say yes. And just what happens in that old example is the sort of thing that happens in the Peran story. So th the old example is this. In the 17th century, Descartes developed a physics before Newton. Okay. And he had a lot of followers. There were a number of, there were, for the next 100 years, there were Cartesian physicists working in Europe. Right, following, working in the Cartesian physics. Um, what was crucial to his physics was that the only quantities that were recognized were ones that were directly measurable. So, and this comes from his metaphysics because he says, you know, what is, uh, what, what is matter like? Well, extension. So, all the attributes of matter are attributes of extension, and that means spatial extension, length, that you can measure with a ruler, duration, temporal extension, you measure with a clock, right? 
So length and, du and duration you can measure directly. And then anything that you can define with that, like velocity, you can measure with clocks and rulers, acceleration. So now we call these, today we call these kinematic, the kinematic quantities. And Descartes' physics is entirely developed with only the kinematic quantities because for him the world is as extension, right? Um, there were problems with Descartes' physics. You know, any science it has problems that have to be solved after all, and so this didn't discourage them. Uh, but Newton, who um, argued against the uh, Cartesian physics, what he did in order to develop his theory was introduce two quantities that are not directly measurable, um, mass and force. And the Cartesians immediately objected that he was doing something really bad for science, that he was bringing back from the Middle Ages what they called occult qualities that were just put in there in order to explain what was happening. And that he was you know, postulating things that were outside experience and that physics should have no, nothing to do with that, right? What did the Newtonians respond? Well, they responded that, no, you are wrong. Mass and force are measurable. Not directly measurable, but measurable. Okay. So uh, the um, uh, George Atwood was one of the Newtonians who was involved in these debates. And this little setup that you see here, we, it's now, uh, we call it the Atwood mis machine. Okay, it has several purposes for, for experimentation. And there's a lot in this that you can directly measure. You see, there's a pulley and a string over it with two weights hanging on it. And of course, you know what will happen. The bigger one is gonna start going down and the little ones start going up. And you can measure the acceleration. And then uh, he says, no, now I can calculate from this. I can calculate the ratio between the two masses. How much bigger one is than the other? I can calculate that. And then if one of the masses is my standard, like say a one kilogram weight or something like that, I'm measuring the mass of the other one. So you see, I can measure the mass. And the Cartesian says, how do you come up with this uh, formula here? Well, I'm using Newton's theory. Okay. Now you can see why this that, that does not uh, satisfy the Cartesian. He says, yeah, well, you're measuring the mass according to your theory, which I don't accept. Right? Well, but the Cartesian is wrong to, to talk that way. Because in fact, what is being done here is exactly what has to be done with the theory. That what has to be shown is that the quantities involved in the theory are connected with measurement in ways that the theory shows, that the theory entails. So that, well, so I call, you know, the term here is empirical grounding. A theory or model is empirically grounded if the quantities in it can have their values determined under realizable experimental conditions relative to the theory. And if if the theory doesn't have that virtue, it is empirically unsuccessful, it's empirically um, inadequate. Um, this, was this was analyzed uh, by Ernst Mach and also by Poincaré, and Ernst Mach points out that, yeah, Atwood is definitely presupposing something in Newtonian physics, in fact, the law of action and reaction. But this is typical of measurement in the sciences. Measurement has to be understood as something that is thoroughly theory involving in the sciences. And that is not a criticism. It, is rather, it rather points out the rather subtle criterion of empirical success that has to be applied to a, to a, to a scientific theory. Um, so this, theory, you know, this uh, concept was developed by Moach, Poincaré, uh, Hermann Weil, Joseph Sneed, Floyd Blimore. Um, the theoretical quantities can only be related to measurement by our theory, but that is exactly what is needed. So now we can go back to Peran and say, well, what was Peran doing? He was doing that. He was doing that. He was finishing the project of uh, empirically grounding the theory that they had been using for the gases. And it was a theory that he knew uh, could be inadequate at some levels, but that was working fine for, uh, at a phenomenal level for the gases and fluids that he was dealing with. Now, the theory had developed a long ways in the past 100 years. It had developed to the point that 
by successive additions, there were now equations that connected all the theoretical quantities with each other, you know, so that, you know, the equations link uh, all these quantities like Avogadro's number, the mass, the size of the molecules, the molecular kinetic energy, and so on. So if only you could determine the value of one of them, you would have essentially de determined the values of all of them, okay? But nobody had yet managed to do that. And I'm, by, by determine the value, I mean relative to the theory, right? Uh, and the theory still, when he began, was not rich enough to design an experiment that would do that. So what Ferran does is he says, just like the physicists before me, I will make one more addition, one more addition to the theory. I'm going to postulate that the behavior of the molecules is exactly, which we cannot see, is exactly like the behavior of the dust particles that we can see. And he recognizes that this is an addition, that it is a postulate, okay? And then with that assumption added, he can calculate the value and he can finish the project of empirical grounding. And that's what he achieved. Okay. So now, you see, what I want to say is, look, this is a very different interpretation of what Perrin is doing. It is an, an empiricist interpretation of what is happening in the science, that they are developing empirically successful theories which is a very different way of understanding it from the understanding that they are trying to find out the truth about what is happening behind what we can touch and see. Okay. So the story of uh, the development of atomic theory in the 19th century from Avogadro to Ferran goes like that. Avogadro is the first one actually to say, I add a hypothesis so we can make something measurable. And then Boltzmann does it. And then, you know, one by one they do it. And then finally, Perrin does, makes the last step and he can design an experiment that will finally find a precise value for one of the quantities, which then is connected to all the others and determines all the values of the quantities. <laughs> so here's my critique of naturalism, okay? I hope, I mean, this was a, a very specific example but I hope that you will see the general critique here, okay? That the naturalist and the empiricist both are anti-foundationalist. They both say, yeah, the, the hope of a rock solid foundation for knowledge and rational belief was a mistake. It was an impossible ideal. We have to learn how to live a life without foundations. We have to learn to think of ourselves as mariners at sea, rebuilding our boat, repairing our boat while we still at sea, okay? But there are two different orientations to this. The naturalist, um, despite the fact that they do not acknowledge it, are actually giving a metaphysical interpretation, going beyond the science by adding an unacknowledged, implicit, metaphysics to it, right? Whereas in the empiricist side, the whole question are questions of interpretation, which for the naturalist just don't arise, cannot be allowed to arise. But for the empiricist, this is the task of philosophy with respect to science. It's an inquiry into the presuppositions that constitute the very condition in which we orient ourselves toward the sciences. So that's it. You have to be have to have a lot of courage to come all the way forward and go to that microphone, but please do. Or if not, just yell. Well, you know, 
uh, there are a number of philosophers who have taken this name and who, in, and who you know, explicitly call themselves naturalists. And um, you know, Penelope Maddy has written a number of papers. One is called Friends and Foes of Naturalism, Friends and Foes. And then uh, the second philosophy is entirely about naturalism. She had started with naturalism in what she calls naturalism in philosophy of mathematics. And so, so I think that it is too late. You know, we cannot do that. And also, they do have a, a history behind them. Now, it's true that you're quite right that the term has been used in many different ways. Um, that if you look back uh, in the etymology and in the use in the 19th century and before that, um, it's quite different. That's true. But um, this group of philosophers at Columbia University in the middle of the 20th century, you know, they sort of took ownership of the name naturalism in philosophy. And um, Klein, who knew them very well, right, um, he continues with that. And, it is, and while today's naturalists don't look back to 1944, they do look back to Klein. And so uh, one of their uh, main um, uh, sources is a paper, Epistemology Naturalized, right? So at this point, you know, it's hard for us to, uh, to try and take a different name. Um, what, what is also true, though, and is that among philosophers, it seems that, uh, as I think you're pointing out, it's being used now to refer to lots of different things. And um, one of the main uses, well, some of the main uses are really in metaphysics uh, about physicalism, how the only things that exist are physical, for example, right? Um, I've tried to stay away from that. Um, in epistemology, there's a very clear naturalist um, I, I can't say theory, because I would say it's not a theory, right? But if we take Quine's article, Epistemology Naturalized at face value, he's telling us, don't bother with philosophy anymore, just give it all over to cognitive science. So he has this point of view, if there's a significant question there, it must be a scientific question. And anything that doesn't, you know, is not a scientific question just doesn't make sense here, right? Now, the people who followed him didn't take that seriously because they continued to do epistemology in a philosophical way. So they didn't just say, okay, let the cognitive scientists have it all, right? Um, the, the, um, the arguments quickly turned to normativity and epistemology, for example. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, uh, there's certainly a lot of justice in what you say and what Galen Strawson said that um, I now find it hard to find any examples where people don't say I'm a naturalist, right? And uh, you then you begin to wonder, well, what's the, what's the contrast? You know, if all these different positions count as naturalist, what, what are we contrasting it with? Yeah. And uh, so I, I hope that, you know, I've, I've tried to see where precisely we can have a strong contrast. Hi. Uh, so the kind of research or the empiricism that you were discussing, would you say that coincides with the idea of a research program like Lakatos talks about? Like who talks about? Uh, Lakatos. Lock, Lakatos. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, well, you see, Lakatos was talking about research programs in the sciences. Um, when he talks about you know uh, theoretically degenerating research programs and you know make you know he's he's talking about criteria for the sciences right um, in a more general sense of research yeah this is a research project I mean um, I want to see if it is possible to reinterpret uh, episodes in the sciences in a way that is consonant with an empiricist approach and um, so. You know, Peran is one example. Uh, in the case of quantum mechanics, you know, there's a great deal of, uh, of has been a great deal of work by philosophers of, of physics who really want to do metaphysics for quantum mechanics. And um, for a while they were actually calling it experimental metaphysics. You know, um, what about um, traditional 
views of causality in the world. Um, does, does quantum mechanics violate traditional philosophical conceptions of, of causality, uh, of individuality, of uh, the I uh, identity of indiscernibles, and so forth, right? Um, so this approach of trying to find uh, a coherent metaphysical um, uh, panoply for science, you know, and a lot of work has gone into that, right? Um, and so I want to say, well, you know, I want to see if, if I have a research program is to try and argue that, and not just argue, but actually produce an empiricist understanding of the very same thing, but one that doesn't postulate anything unobservable, that, is, that you know, does, not, does not say that you need to, to construct a metaphysical theory in order to understand science. Um, well, you see, ontology, ontology uh, usually presented as, uh, as subspecies of metaphysics, right? Um, and uh, I want to say that it's, it's part of empiricism to be, empiricism today, not to the 18th century, is to be a common sense realist. That is, all the things that we can touch and see, we have no qualms or problems about reference to those things. Um, that um, so that's a common sense realism, right? Um, if that's ontology already, fine. Then that's ontology, right? Now the naturalist apparently uh, seems to have the naturalist like Maddie at least says, for me there is no problem at all about reference to unobservables. And then we can start asking questions. We can say. Um, say, Jim refers to atoms. What is this relation refers to? What kind of basis must it have in the world for that relation to hold? Um, you know, in the case of a person, we can probably look at it, we can probably find a causal chain. If I say, um, a Jim referred to Obama, I don't mean that he's actually, actually touched him or seen him, but there's a whole causal chain you know, from person to person to person that stretches between Obama and Jim. So I, I know under what conditions it's possible for Jim to refer to Obama. But under what conditions is it possible to refer so to something that is unobservable and that was postulated in order to explain some observable thing? What kind of relation must there be there, right? So I can raise questions. There'll be critical questions about the ontology but there will not be an attempt to develop a systematic ontology in that cell. Yes? Have you guys tried uh, empiricism? Mm -hmm. This whole Ayer's argument that, look, that this observation has to be explicitly empirical, but it only has to be reduced to an empirical observation at some point in that chain, or is in this Well, you know, when I say observation, I really am just talking about our, uh, our perceptions, okay? Um, so that, um, you know, mic microscopes these days are very sophisticated. You know, the microscope is connected to a computer and the image is on the screen. Now, what is it that I see? Suppose that the you have a slide that, you know, we say, um, this is a picture of the paramecia, okay? But what are you seeing? You're seeing the picture on the screen, okay? And of course, you can say, yeah, but you know, the theory tells me that you, know, that you get that picture only if there are paramecia there. But it is mediated by the theory in that case, right? So I, I'm willing to, uh, to say uh, we can have a nice name for that connection, but the word seeing, we should just keep for that, seeing the picture, okay? Um, so when I say that uh, the success of science is empirical success, I mean it is a, a success that is manifest in actual human experience. 
with the human perceptual limitations that we have. Um, does that get at your question? But, but of course, with the technology, okay? I mean, we are interacting with the technology, but I think it's um, uh, an extrapolation um, of the words if we say that we can just see through the, the, the technology. I don't think that's correct. Yes? Yeah, so I say that, you know, a scientific theory doesn't have to be true to be good. It has to be true about the empirical stuff, okay? And um, it has often enough happened in the history of science that you would get two different models for the same phenomena. And in these models, you would have very different things in the model, right, that aside from the part that fits the phenomena that we can see and touch, right? Um, and then I would say they're both good models. And they can be useful maybe for different purposes. Um, but um, the naturalist, as Madi presents the naturalist today, is entirely at home inside the sciences. And the question of a distinction between truth and empirical success doesn't you know, arise for him anymore. He'll say, no, um, my starting point is what the sciences tell me. And I see nothing outside that. So if the scientists tell me that the world is made up out of atoms, fine, that's what I believe. Okay? Um, and I don't have questions that go outside the ones that the scientist is answering. Um, I think that the Mm -hmm. Without yeah. having to really buy into all of the aspects. Right. So yes. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I think we can we can uh, push them on that. I mean, on, on what basis do they do that? And they can say they can say something like consensus among the physicists or something like that if they want. But you know, the fact is that at the, uh, the avant-garde physicists are all working on different things, you see? And they, they are not so hide bound about that. They, they are adventurous and they like to look at alternatives. And they don't, they don't say, oh, this was established, so that's the truth of the matter, right? Um, but it's the philosophers who like to have a solid metaphysics who try to, you know. So, I mean, Peter van Inwagen is a, uh, a philosopher who I think uh, you know, really, really does that. So, um, you know, he, wa he wrote me at one point saying, look, it's just common sense that the world is, is the way that the scientist says here, it's made up of atoms and so on, I believe that. And, and so I said to him, uh, well, I'm gonna send you a little paper by a famous physicist, which has the title, Particles Do Not Exist, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and anyway, this was a point that, you know, about relativistic theories and the number of particles and so on, uh, but the number is not defined. And so he never answered that. <laughs> so I, I think that philosophers would like to extrapolate science into a metaphysical theory, but it just isn't really a successful enterprise. Mm. Mm. Well, you know, I really want to make a distinction between the science between science and the way science is understood by the naturalist. Okay, uh, 
I do not think that being scientific requires being nationalist or being or being secular. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's uh, it's um, it is uh, when when the so the nationalist says not only I accept the sciences, and I would say fine, you know, you want to believe all that, believe it. Uh, that's not irrational, you know, mm -hmm. um, fine. But then they say, yeah, but any question outside that makes no sense. Okay, and um, that and and this and. You know, I think this must, uh, when she says, interested only in the psychology of religion, right, or that's implied, uh, only interested in the psychology or sociology of other, and I say, yeah, well, okay, uh, this doesn't come from believing in science, right? You know, you draw, you're, you're, you know, rejecting something outside, but that's not, you know, doesn't come from accepting science, right? Um, so I think that, you know, but it's not just, for the religious that this opens up, uh, you know, it makes life more free, right? Um, because if you, if you think that the only thing that is cognitively significant is the answers that we get within science, then, you know, art and aesthetic experience and so on are also gone, right? So um, I feel that, you know, this is a way of freeing us by having a, a, a different kind of relation to the sciences, while at the same time, you know, I mean, I think science is a paradigm of rational inquiry, no question about it, and that um, it is enormously successful, right, by giving us a great deal of empirical knowledge. Okay. So it is not disparaging science at all. Uh, I agree with what uh, Jimmy Kim said about it. It's just that yeah. uh, right. that's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Yeah. People who are constructing string theory models are very much like the artist. Yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, when I think about logical positivists, I think that they were trying very hard to give a very precise form to empiricism. So they were working in the 20s and 30s, right? And they were not successful in uh, much of what they did. Um, they, um, you know, they, they thought that they could do a great deal just with uh, formal logic, formal syntax of language, and so on. Um, that they could very simply connect what is meaningful with what is verifiable, you know. And no, they were unsuccessful. They, were, they failed in this, right? At the same time, what they were trying to do is what I also want to try to do, which is to develop an empiricism that is viable, you know, that doesn't make the mistakes of the past, right? And it's just that, look, around 1960, we found out just where they had failed, right? But a big reaction to that was scientific realism, you know, Sellers and Feigl and so on. I think there's another reaction, which is, no, let's do better, but with the same aim of developing an empiricist view, not a, sci not a metaphysical one. Thank you. Okay.